My name is John Burroughs, and this poem comes from my early collection, 6-9, Improvisations in Dependence. It was published in June 2009, hence the title of the book. And the poem was inspired by Andy Warhol's pop art. It's entitled, Karma Sutra. Tin Can Karma in a Cemetery Green Sedan drives into the past through the future, running round and round and over and over the illusory track of time, like a bomb that never goes off, like a song that rings in Campbell's soup cans, round and round the rims, not going out or in, just sticking to the circuit like a one-ring soup can gerbil wheel circus, till the tin finally erodes. The illusion of time caves in, and full circle cemetery green karma darts to the next can in the Isle of Now. This poem comes from my 2012 collection, The Eater of the Absurd, and it's entitled, Mark This. I should also mention that it was originally written for a Poem in Your Pocket bookmark contest, which it won, and was, and was published by La Pink Elephant Press back in 2009, before it was collected in this 2012 book. Mark This. Doesn't matter if you laminate me, Punch a hole in the end of me. Create a neck on me you can tie a pretty rope around. I don't care if you stick me in Shakespeare, in Salinger, or Dr. Seuss. Leave me in some tedious tome you intend to finish at some point, but never do. Or pick your teeth with me. Drop me thoughtlessly on the floor for your puppy to chew. I am the sun and air of tall trees who, though often abused and misused, have gladly given their hearts and bark for the sake of warm homes and art. I'm much more than a bookmark. This poem was published in 2018 by the Gasconade Review. It was originally written for an ecphrastasy program at Heights Arts in Cleveland Heights and inspired by an artwork entitled Far Enemy by Tony Ingrisano. No Other. A wide web of geometry and pixelation looms over my brick suburban bungalow. The colors warm and entice me with creeping fluorescent sophistication. I feel them drawing me up and in, while equally I am drawing them inside. It's a network of jasmine attraction, bringing untoward craving and resentment, hate and cruelty from America the beautiful, Russian bots, unacknowledged racists, television networks, Amazon.com, Nihilism proponents, penile enhancement specialists, trolls, moles, sexist Pauls, and ad mongers, while the colors of it all bleed into pools of need and reaction, stupefaction, failure to listen, disguised as debate, hasty action, dystopian dissatisfaction, snark disguised as lark and warring factions. This poem began as an expression of appreciation for a wide web of precious colors and pixelation before I met the so-called far enemies in my bathroom mirror and hardly recognized them as something other than other. This poem is inspired by a true story about a man who spent 11 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. It comes from my 2013 chapbook, 
It Takes More Than Chance to Make Change, published by the Poets Haven. And the title is A Wrinkle in Time. Rip Van Wrinkle is about to be pressed under an incredible weight of cold, someone else's warm gold, until his celestial unconsciousness and terrestrial conscience awaken in vicious yet voluptuous time. Rip Van Wrinkle knows not his place of birth, his purpose on earth, but what concern is that to a man who wanders dimly, by turns glibly and grimly across broken dream pavements through heretofore unmapped brambles. Rip Van Wrinkle gambles that he cannot fail to uncover the dismal yet fortunate truth which in the manner of many before he might overlook in a restless quest to confirm his suspicion that somehow all or none of this is his or God's mission, though he doesn't see much difference. When finally the last of the gold has been mined and the press loses its icy heft, Rip Van will awake and thaw arise from a decade largely undecayed and purposefully drive on a bolder and wiser, unapologetically irrepressible. This is a poem near and dear to my heart. It comes from my latest chapbook, Loss and Foundering, which was published in 2018 by Night Ballet Press. Unfounded. In this city of lost places, my 15-year-old daughter is no longer hiding all the places she cuts herself to hide all the places she hurts. I imagine it's because she does not want to die and the cutting makes her feel alive or because she feels dead inside, or like, hell, I can only speculate why, because she cannot tell. In my city of lost places, there are six urns, two wooden boxes, a metal canister, and three fancier ones from the funeral home, full of ashes and bone bits, our dogs Lucky and Lady, her 18-year-old cat Cricket, my mother-in-law, sister-in-law Sherry, and wife Jerry Lynn, because I cannot bear to bury them. In my city of lost places, there is a light that never goes out, and there is an out that never gets lit, and there is a fit that never gets fought, and there is an it that never gets sought or wrought. In my city of lost places, the oyster is my world until it is not anymore, and still sometimes is, and there is a this that cannot be that, and there is an at that cannot be bliss, and it seems all things are hurting and healing and feeling like cutting themselves. In my city of lost places, a seamstress has come undone. A teacher has failed to master the lesson and a doctor has caught his death. I imagine it's because she does not want to live and the cutting makes her feel dead, or loved inside, or like, hell, I can only speculate and expectorate why when I do not know. In my city of lost places, it's the first anniversary of my wife's death. Her clothing is still in our dresser, and hanging in my closet, 
and the black-framed family photo collage from her hospital room still sits in my living room on her former makeup table. And her makeup is still in my bathroom with her tweezers and scissors and razor and whatever has not yet been cut is torn apart. And I feel her with me and not and realize sometimes it's easiest to love your mate unconditionally when she no longer expects anything of you. This poem had its original inspiration in the bumper stickers we used to give out at the gay bar where I worked in the early 90s during the height of the AIDS epidemic. The bumper sticker said, silence equals death. And I started to think about that years later, about how silence is also equal, in many cases, to complicity. And all that came together into this poem, which comes from my 2012 chapbook, The Eater of the Absurd. It's entitled, Lens. Violence! Silence. Violence. Silence! Less is more and more is less, and silence is most golden to the rich and oppressive, and would be impressive if not for the give gone missing from nature's desired balance. Give and take and give and take and take and take and the record keeps skipping. Time to pull out the needle. Violence! Silence. Violence. Silence! Stuck in the same groove. Sometimes I feel like an acquisition infected by a control bot running as my masters intend whenever anyone sticks coins into my slot like I'm programmed to consume and consume, subsume, take a nap and resume, consume, subsume, because size matters, bigger is better, stronger, faster. Forget impending disaster, I want to be the 60 million dollar man when I grow down. Can't wake up, need to drink more coffee. Can't go to sleep, need to drink more wine. Always hungry, need more mine. All the time in between, never satisfied. I dine and dine on more and more swine. Prove the proverb true. I am what I eat. Maybe you are too. Violence. Silence. Violence. Silence! Distinction blurs. So kill them all and let God sort them out. We human would-be gods can't wait to start sorting the money and land and command the dead leave behind. But first, we need your ass <coughs> assistance. Be all that you can be. Join. Consume. Follow, consume, collect, consume, kill, consume, die, consumed, submission accomplished, violence, silence, violence, silence, contract the compound, distill its essence, Sigh, violence. Vi, silence. Contract it further. Vi, vice. You can spell it either way with an S or a C. Violence, silence. Vice, vice. 
Vice, vice, baby, the record keeps skipping, the handle keeps turning, the head I've been helping to squeeze is my own and my children's. Time to pull out the needle. Stop churning the handle. Look in a mirror for a moment. Put my vying and my sighing aside and focus my lens. This poem, although it was written in 2008, still, unfortunately, applies today. It came from my first chapbook, Bloggerl, which I made when I wasn't even expecting to start a press, only to have some poems of mine to hand out at readings. But the poem, unlike the rest of the chapbook, keeps sticking with me, and so this is Bloodshot. Indian summer sun squints, bloodshot like the wide, wounded eyes of my cynical Seneca ancestors. On and on and anon, an endless queue of unrelenting conquistadors lusting for booty or bust, defile our trust and defame the name of God in the name of God. Opportunity does not knock for trusting tribesmen, be we from Arizona, the Amazon, Africa, or Akron, Ohio. Riding roughshod over every allegedly endless empire, including America, the beautifully dutiful, the cursed hearse of history leads a parade of pathetic and unsympathetic plotters, plodders, priests, and presidents, electable eels who feel their forked tongues and dung make them agents of distinction instead of extinction. Sweetly sighing, lullabies of liberty and expediency, these leaders open their bomb bays as they pray, first for the unconditional surrender of our enemies, and last, if at all, for the bloodshot souls of the soon-to-be-charred children of Hiroshima, Hanoi, Belfast, Baghdad, Bethlehem, New York City, and coming soon to a theater of war near you. Thank you.